Hello and good evening. My name is Tawana Holland. I'm a member of Annapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I am your mistress of ceremony for this evening for the program In Living Color, COVID Vaccine Equity Webinar. We have a robust program from 7 p.m. to 8.30, including expert panelists, testimonials, and a wonderful moderator, Tori Snow. But first, we will start with our welcome by Joanne Scipio, our co-chair of the Annapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Physical and Mental Health Committee. Thank you, Sora Tawana. I'd like to welcome you, all of you, on behalf of the Physical and Mental Health Com Committee of the Annapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. I'd like to just mention our committee members. First, we have Tiffany Bell, and I'm doing this in alphabetical order. Stephanie Byers, who is also my co-host. Tiffany Cobb, Crystal Evans, Lotoya Angolo, Cheryl Lightsey, and Courtney Salisbury. We wanted to put together, the, the committee has worked hard on putting this together. We wanted to put this webinar together in living color, COVID-19 equity, because people of color are dying at an in exorbitant rate compared to the rest of the population. We reached our 500,000 mark just, what, two days ago. And of those 500,000, 15% of the deaths have been Blacks. We only represent 13% of the population, so we see that that is an unusually large number for us. That's why it's so important for us to take the vaccine. Taking the vaccine so that we can live, we can be with our loved ones, we can do things that we, we were used to doing. But in order to take the, get the, vaccine, the disease under control, we have to take the vaccine. Now we know that there are reasons why people of color don't wanna take the vaccine. And I think the number one reason is the lack of trust. And we know that there's really evidence of, of history of lack of trust because we have been exploited in the past. But a lot of things have changed and we've come a long way and there are a lot of safeguards in place so that it's not the same. Also, we don't wanna take the vaccine because we don't, understand the history of the vaccine and what the vaccine does. There's also the equity of the vaccine. Is it available? And are we ready to take it when it is available? So what we want you to do when watching this webinar is decide, is the vaccine for you? And it should be. You have the privilege and the responsibility to take it for your welfare, and if you don't wanna take it for yourself, you wanna take it for your loved ones so that we can stay alive long enough to see them, so that we don't infect them, because nobody wants to watch a funeral of a loved one virtually when we could have prevented it. So in the meantime, until it's time for you to get your vaccine, wear your mask, wash your hands, and social distance. Thank you, Soror. Now I will introduce our moderator for the evening. Mr. Tori Snow is the host of WBAL's The Tori Snow Program, WBAL's Afternoon Drive Program. He moved to Anne Arundel County, Maryland in 2006 after graduating college. He took a job teaching at a local school and immediately immersed himself into the community. He worked primarily with families in local underserved community. He transitioned careers to IT in 2008 and served as a manager for a computer systems administration team. He ran for the Anne Arundel County Council in 2018. In 2020, Tori again switched careers and joined the WBAL broadcast team as a full-time talk show host. Tori also currently serves on the Maryland Commission for African-American History. 
Tori and his wife, Joanna, have a daughter and three sons. Please welcome Mr. Tori Snow. And uh, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Ms. Hall, and I do appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for joining this program. Now, uh, I know that many of us have been on Zoom calls probably more than any of us care to. Uh, the team has put together a really good program. And so I want to encourage everyone to engage in this discussion. Um, I want to be introducing our panelists. We all we have fantastic panelists. Uh, if you don't feel overly awkward doing so, feel free to uh, wave to our panelists or clap in the privacy of your own homes or whatever we can. We are right around the corner. And if we get these vaccines, uh, you know, we get people to take them and we can get to the immunity that we need soon, we'll be able to gather uh, in person uh, and hopefully be able to, you know, focus on some of the other issues in our community. So I'm actually very, very excited um, for this discussion. Uh, we do have three panelists uh, that we present to you today. Our first panelist will be Dr. Stacy Garrett Ray, uh, the Vice President and Medical Director of the University of Maryland Medical Systems Population Health Services Organization. It's also the president of both the University of Maryland Quality Care Network and Transform Health MD. As a board certified family physician, Dr. Garrett Ray continues to practice primary care in Maryland and currently serves is the University of Maryland Medical Systems COVID-19 Response Community Provider Liaison. Please take a moment in the privacy of your homes and welcome Dr. Stacy Garrett Ray. Our next panelist will be Dr. D Dr. Nilesh Kaliana Rahman. He's the Health Officer for Anne Arundel County Department of Health. Dr. Kaliana Rahman is responsible for leading, planning, developing, and executing all public health initiatives for Anne Arundel County, with a current emphasis on eliminating the COVID-19 virus and the distribution of the vaccine to county residents. Please take a moment and welcome Dr. Nilesh Kaliana Rahman. Our final panelist is Shannon P. Burton. She's the lead stroke nurse practitioner at MedStar Washington Hospital Center located in Washington, DC. She completed her MSN and acute care nurse practitioner clinical nurse specialist certification at Georgetown University. Please take a moment and welcome Shannon P. Burton. Now, we have a number of questions that have been solicited from the community and I do wanna emphasize uh, all of the questions that will be asked of our panelists are uh, from the community. We'll try to get to as many as we can, but we may not get to all of them. We do want to remind you that you can visit the CDC website, as well as the Anne Arundel County Department of Health website for the most updated information. And um, maybe Dr. Nilesh Kaliana Rama can remind us exactly what website that is when we get to him. I, I don't know what the actual letters are, but uh, those are good places to get information. Uh, but we, before we do that, we're gonna get into some of these questions, but the team has prepared just a brief poll. We do wanna encourage everyone to participate in this poll. There's just a couple of questions uh, that we've put together because I do think that you know it's important for us to get a good idea of where we are as a community and how important the message is. And so there are two questions that we've asked. Have you taken the vaccine? It's simple, yes or no. And number two, and this is actually the more important one, with the information you have now, I'm talking about before this discussion, would you take the vaccine if given the opportunity today? You can answer those questions and uh, as more people uh, join, we will track that and then we'll present this information and then we'll revisit this discussion to figure out, you know, and this will be really helpful and be as honest as you can because at the end of the day, all of this information is being collected. It's going to be uh, helpful as far as what messages are gonna be moving and perhaps what, how we can continue to improve our messaging as it relates to uh, persuading people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. So while that polling question is up, um, I do want to take a moment and uh, again, remind all of our panelists and thank them for their time for joining us. 
Uh, I know Dr. Nilesh Kalyana Raman has very empty days these days. So <laughs> as well as Dr. Gary and nurse, uh, nurse Shannon, I, I'll call you Shannon, I promise. But I, I'm telling you, I have such respect for our nurses, especially nurses played a key role uh, in our own families. Uh, life. So thank you all for your service. And um, while we're getting this discussion warmed up, I think I want to start with Dr. Uh, Stacy Garrett Ray. And Dr. Garrett Ray, can you give us a little bit of background about the history of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, the timeline that it was developed and where we are today? Sure. Uh, so, so I want to make sure everybody understands that this, this vaccine did not just come overnight. Um, and I think that sometimes we have that feeling that because of the fact that it usually takes years and years and years, um, and we hear about that process and how long it can take, that it, for some of us, it may have felt like, wow, this seemed very quick. It actually, the research teams have been working on this for several years. Uh, so for instance, the Moderna vaccination, which a lot of the research was led by Dr. Kazmichia Corbett, uh, down at NIH, a UMBC grad. Uh, she had been working on this for the past six, almost seven years on the mRNA vaccination itself. And the same with several researchers throughout the country um, and internationally. So this happened for uh, several years to get to that type of process that we could use something that's new called an mRNA vaccination. So right now, I think most of us are very familiar with hearing about Pfizer as well as Moderna vaccinations. Those are vaccines that utilize something that's called an mRNA process or mRNA vaccine, vaccine, messenger RNA. And the other vaccine which we're hearing about is called Johnson & Johnson. And um, then Johnson & Johnson uses a different type of process. Now, um, in terms of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, those um, mRNA, the best way to describe it is that that messenger is taking information or instructions and taking those to our cells to say, listen, I need you to make something that's a harmless protein or a spike protein. I want you to help us so that we know if COVID-19 comes in, how do we build an immune response or antibodies so we fight against it? So it's almost like giving us instructions to say, listen, this is gonna come your way. How are we going to respond? And if it does, it could actually hurt our, our bodies. And so that's when we start to build antibodies and attack. That mRNA vaccine, um, Pfizer and Moderna have no COVID vaccine or COVID virus in them. So that's really important to know but it's helping our bodies to understand um, in terms of what happens if we are exposed to it, right? Um, so that's, that's how those two work. Those actually require two doses each. Uh, so that's why, you know, and I know that um, our Anne Arundel Health Department has been working on this and making sure that once you get your first shot, you have to get an appointment for your second. Um, for the Pfizer vaccination, that is uh, three weeks or 21 days in between, and the Moderna is 28 days in between. So those are how those two work. Now, Johnson & Johnson, that's the newer one that we're hoping that we get um, approval for, uh, ready to roll, hopefully at the end of the week. Um, that is the, what uh, we're, we're hoping on, fingers crossed. But that can be a game changer for us. Um, that one, again, those have been in development for years um, as well, but this is actually using a virus. Um, so what it does, same thing. How do I how do I have something that I can um, have go into uh, go into my body so that it actually can say, listen, if I'm ever exposed to COVID, what are you going to do, and can I fight this off? So that's how these viruses work, um, or vaccinations work, um, to help to build our immune system. So, uh, so that's where we are with those uh, three at this time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Garrett Ray, for that. And actually, as a follow-up question to Dr. Kaliana Rahman, for Moderna and Pfizer, they are two-dose vaccines. Uh, with the reports of there being a shortage of vaccines, uh, some people want to know if they get the first dose for the vaccine, will the second dose be available within the time frame required? And what happens if you don't get your second dose within that time frame? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Um, so when you get that first dose of either Pfizer or Moderna, there is a second dose that's got your name on it, actually. And so part of, part of um, getting these limited doses out right now is making sure that that second dose is there, it's coming. So that's why um, anybody who's gotten that first dose, we like to get their second dose appointment on the books before they even leave the room. Um, and so if you're not able to make it and it's three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks for Moderna, um, the current recommendations are that you can, get it, you can get it done within six weeks, but we're seeing other countries are going even longer. If you missed that time, whether it's three or four weeks, get it as soon as you can. Um, so does that mean that you, it doesn't start over? You just, it just helps to get it with as soon as you can after that time frame. That's correct. You don't, you don't have to start over a new series again. You're okay. just that booster as soon as you can after that time period. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. And um, actually shifting over to Shannon Burton, uh, someone wants to know, how do you know if you have a cold or if you have COVID? Uh, what's the major factor that differentiates between the two? Yeah, so um, generally when patients have colds, they're very mild in nature. Um, usually when we're saying like cold versus or flu versus co the coronavirus or COVID-19, a lot of the symptoms are very similar with the chills, the fever, the body aches. Um, some differences that you can see and which you've probably heard in reports are patients who are, are people who have talked about the loss of taste or the loss of smell. Generally, you don't see that in patients who have the flu. So that's one thing that we are seeing with patients with COVID-19. Also, um, the when patients start to develop symptoms. So usually when you have the flu, once you get infected, you get symptoms within like the first a day or up to four days. But with coronavirus, we're seeing that patients can start to exhibit symptoms anywhere from two to 14 days. So that um, symptom period to present itself usually is a little bit longer in COVID-19. So um, it's, I think the guidance that we've been getting is that if you have symptoms and you're not sure, you should get tested anyway. Is that generally the guidance? Correct. Correct. Because sometimes it is very hard to differentiate the two. Um, and sometimes with COVID-19, you can have very subtle symptoms, very mild symptoms. Um, not everybody will experience severe symptoms. So in order to kind of tease out which one you may have, it is best to contact your healthcare provider um, and speak to them about your symptoms. But as also you go to your local um, CVS or um, healthcare facility for COVID-19 testing. And Dr. Kaliana Rahman, can you tell us about the current status of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in Anne Arundel County as far as supply goes? Sure. So at the health department, we're getting 3,400 doses uh, a week. Uh, those are first doses. We get the second doses automatically. <clears throat> Our hospital partners and around the medical center, Baltimore, Washington Center, Center, they're getting a few hundred, anywhere from two to 300 doses a week. Um, which is mainly going towards, uh, towards new staff, some community programs. Um, and then there's a, there's a few retail pharmacies which, have, uh, which are doing vaccinations in the county, uh, giant uh, CVS. Um, we, are, we, we have five sites that we're operating out of, um, Bay Meadow in Glen Burnie, Maryland Live in Hanover, the community college in, in Arnold, and then this week, we're starting at Lula Scott down in South County and uh, the O'Malley Annex in, in Odenton. Um, and I think most importantly, we're starting our community vaccination clinics starting next week. So working with faith-based institutions and other community partners to do vaccinations directly in the community so people can um, have easier access to it and to reach uh, Black and Hispanic communities who might not otherwise be getting vaccinated. So uh, our vaccine supply is determined by the state. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have control over that, or we'd be doing a lot more than we are now. Wonderful. And don't let me forget, I want to come back to the community vaccination clinics, but I do want to shift over to Dr. Garrett Ray. And can you give us a little bit of insight about these mutations? There's a lot of talk about the mutations and whether the new uh, vaccines are going to work. Why is COVID-19 mutating the way that it is? Uh, great question. So, so the thing is, viruses want to live, right? So, 
So they're, they're similar to people, they want to survive. And so the, the way that they try to survive is that they try to disguise themselves. So remember, we were talking about how either our body fights against it through, if you're vaccinated, you have your immunity. If potentially you had, co you know, you built some immunity if you've had um, COVID, maybe a brief period. Or in general, our bodies try to fight these off just like with a cold or just like with flu. And so the viruses try to say, okay, I'm going to change change up a little bit. So, um, so great analogy that actually a friend um, gave to me um, said, listen. This reminds me almost like going in disguise to a party, okay? A variant is very similar to that. They want to come into a party and not be detected, so they may put on a hat, or they may put on, on a mustache, or they may put on a different jacket, hoping that you don't recognize them to kick them out. <laughs> That's the best way to be able to describe the variant. So right now, there are really three variants that people are talking about mostly. They're talking about UK, they're talking about the one in South Africa or one that is in um, uh, South America or Brazil area too. So that's how variants are um, in terms of when you try to compare how this variant is working with, with flu, it's a little bit slower in terms of time framing that that's what we're seeing. But again, the key thing is if we can try to control this either doing the three W's, washing our hands, watching our distance, washing our, you know, wearing a mask, that reduces our ability to spread. The virus comes into the body and then tries to change, and then we'll try to continue to move around. So that's why it's so important to still do all the things that we're doing, but then when your time has come to get the vaccine, that helps us all to make sure that we are controlling the variants and controlling what's going on with, with COVID right now. So uh, this is actually uh, an interesting uh, question. And actually, I'm going to direct this to uh, Shannon Burton. If you happen to get COVID, um, obviously, you know, the nature of things as they are, um, in addition to the prescribed medication, are there any dietary or herbal supplements that you might recommend to help with the symptoms? Obviously, we know that you can't treat the COVID-19, but... Um, what can people do to treat some of the symptoms if they happen to get COVID? Yeah, so um, if you're having fever, um, you can definitely treat that fever with over-the-counter Tylenol. Um, you can also, if you have a cough and the cough is pretty, can be pretty rough and is causing you chest pain and things like that, you can also take other medications like Robitussin, but I would also say check with your healthcare provider to make sure those medications are safe for you to take. Um, as far as like herbal supplements, um, you know, CDC, there have been multiple studies that people have conducted, um, but none of those supplements that people that you might have heard about, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, have really been shown to prevent or treat COVID-19. There are some small studies that show um, that certain supplements can be helpful, um, but they haven't shown to reduce the mortality or your rate of dying um, by taking them. So if you're going to take herbal supplements, I would say contact your healthcare provider, um, because sometimes if you take those, those pills or medications in access, it can cause other effects in your body. So we want to just make sure that you're being safe, that you're not overusing vitamin C, that you're not overusing vitamin D to try to give yourself extra protection when it may not necessarily be protecting you. So it's always good to have a trusted healthcare provider that you can talk to and discuss these things with so that you're not putting yourself at any increased danger by taking overtaking supplements. Because some supplements also can cause other things like causing the blood to clot more easily or causing you to bleed more easily. And so we wouldn't want you to have those type of effects on top of having COVID-19. That's actually a really good point. And uh, I, I kind of was you know, thinking to myself, if my grandma were still around, she'd probably tell me to drink some ginger oil and take some castor oil. <laughs> we have modern medicine, so, so that's really good. Um, and there's but nothing wrong with like <laughs> drinking herbal teas, you know, yeah. if that makes your throat feel better, if that makes your yeah. chest feel better. I think those things, those type of things are fine, but just being careful with these over-the-counter supplements um, is definitely worth, you know, watching out for. I'd say that's especially important knowing that there are predatory entities out there that are looking to get their own 
agendas pushed. Dr. Kalyana Raman, um, can we talk a bit about the timeline for the vaccines? Currently, the state of Maryland is in phase 1C. Different jurisdictions are moving it along at different paces. Uh, what can you tell us about the timeline and when do you expect, based on the forecast, that we may be getting to general population access for the vaccine? Sure, so, so as you know, to the states at 1C, um, we as a county are, are 1B to make sure that we um, don't leave behind those who are 75 and older or educators, make sure we get as, as many of them who want it. Um, we're hearing that there's gonna be greater vaccine availability during the month of March, um, both with the Johnson & Johnson um, coming up for approval in a couple of days and, and the Pfizer and Moderna uh, talking about increased production. And so, That'll help move us along. I think that we'll be looking at getting into um, really pushing harder into phase 1C in the month of March, getting into phase two somewhere in April, May. And then I think by the late spring, um, we'll, early summer, we'll, we'll be able to make it so that folks who want it can get the shot. Awesome. Thank you for uh, those details. And I'm, I'm excited. I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but the, the sunshine is coming up, right? They say it's darkest before dawn. And uh, we, we're just getting lots of good news. And for those who may not know, tomorrow, we're getting another mass vaccination site uh, in Baltimore City, the Mente Bank Stadium. So, um, and actually, you know, I'm curious to hear from uh, Shannon on this. As we move into this next phase, we do want to make sure we don't forget our caregivers, um, and the people that, you know, there still could be a few months before we get to where we want to be. What are your suggestions for uh, people that are, you know, caring for family members and uh, even caregivers, right, other medical professionals as well, you know, for protecting themselves as well as their patients? What are some of the best practices that come to your mind with that? Yeah, so kind of like what uh, Dr. Garrett Ray mentioned, those three W's, you know, washing your hands, wearing your mask, um, and then, you know, wiping down high touch surfaces and social distancing. So those things we're definitely recommending. But as a caregiver, when you're caring for your loved one, um, if you start to exhibit any symptoms, you want to make sure you're getting tested. You want to make sure that you're also wearing a mask to be helpful if you can help provide that person with their medications, refill medications if they need it, help them to fulfill the any instructions given to them by their doctor, um, monitoring the patient's symptoms. So if you see that your loved one is starting to struggle, starting to have increased in shortness of breath or chest pain, changes in mental status, just knowing when you need to escalate that person's care and call for emergency assistance. So calling 911 if they have a sudden change in mental status, if they're hard to arouse or you can't arouse them at all, um, if they're having any episodes of severe diarrhea or, or severe vomiting, um, just knowing when to escalate that care and just also keeping yourself safe. So, you know, continuing to make sure that you're social distancing as much as you can, um, you're washing your hands, you are wiping down any high touch um, surfaces in the home that may be used by you or that loved one. Um, so those are definite ways to try to keep yourself safe. Those are some great tips. And um, for those that may have joined us, I know a few people have joined us. Just as a quick reminder, uh, we're having a conversation with uh, three panelists who are professionals in this field. Dr. Stacy Garrett Ray, uh, who is uh, many, many titles, the Vice President Medical Director of the University of Maryland Medical Systems Population Health Services Organizations. That's a mouthful. Do, do you give your full title whenever you meet people, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I just say I, 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 I just work. <laughs> so. For our purposes, we'll call her Dr. Garrett Ray. We're also joined by Dr. Nilesh Kaliana Rahman, who's the health officer for Anne Arundel County, and Shannon P. Burton, who is a uh, lead stroke nurse practitioner at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. They're helping us have a discussion about, um, you know, getting a better better understanding of, of COVID-19 and the importance of the vaccine. Let's talk about why we're really here. Um, there's a part of a, a, a major effort with specific outreach to the Black and African American community. Dr. Garrett Ray, why is why are we having this need for a targeted engagement specifically to black communities 
about the COVID-19 vaccine? So uh, the, the key thing is that right now we have been seeing over the past year, because it's almost been a year that we've been dealing with a pandemic, that we have higher numbers in terms of COVID-19 cases in our black and brown communities, as well as our Latina community as well. Um, and it's not only just about the number of cases, it's that we actually have uh, five times more likely to be hospitalized if we have COVID, as well as three times more likely to die. And so we are losing generations. We, I, I, I'm gonna tell you personally, I've had loss from COVID. Um, the fear is that we are losing people's family members, loved ones because of this. And there's a way that we can all come out of this and try to survive as much as possible. Um, I think that, you know, uh, our, our keynote, I guess, or who, who kicked us off um, had mentioned that, you know, there's a time where we all want to go back to some semblance of normalcy and being able to give hugs to people and to spend time and to celebrate and not deal with having to, to really celebrate people's lives and, and funerals over COVID, right? Um, and so right now, that's why we have so much a push, but I think it's also about having the discussion about understanding the history that is causing some of us to hesitate and, and question whether or not this is actually a choice for us. It is a choice for us. Right, right. You know? And um, Dr. Kaliana Rahman, uh, I know that you, you have equity at, at the center of everything that you're discussing. What has your experience taught you about the hesitancy from within the Black community about vaccines and, uh, you know, some people are saying, why are they trying to target Black people with this vaccine? You know, how, why, why, do, why does that sentiment exist based on your knowledge and what do we do to overcome that? Yeah, so there, that sentiment comes from a number of places, right? It's got, it's got its root, roots in historical issues around trust and the breaking of that trust. Um, it's got that issue in terms of public health, in terms of the healthcare systems, uh, in terms of, frankly, having our current systems um, that aren't as responsive to, to Blacks. We see that, you know, I think the, I think the most telling thing is that COVID came along um, a year ago and quickly found, and we quickly found that Blacks were being disproportionately affected. Either the virus is racist or we've got an issue in our society. And I think we all know the answer to that question, right? And so it's those kinds of issues that have been happening for decades and centuries that, that get us to this point where it's reasonable to say, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're being disproportionately impacted. I'm not sure about this virus. Uh, sorry, not this virus, this vaccine. Um, and and that's just that's just one example. People have their own personal issues around healthcare that they've received trust in science, who's telling them information and who they trust. And I think our goal really is to engage that conversation. Do I want you to get the vaccine? Yes. Who are, I mean, you is everybody. That, I, think, I think that's pretty clear, right? But everybody, we have, we each of us have different people that we trust, right? Who, who, who do we trust? And so I think part of this conversation is engaging as many different communities and sectors as we can to have that conversation, to understand what the questions and the concerns are, and honestly, to listen. Um, I found that engaging community and listening is far more powerful than telling somebody and then walking away. So I'm interested to get a nurse's perspective on this because um, nurses are the front line of everything that we do when it comes to healthcare. And Shannon, you know, as a, as a nurse at the MedStar you know, hospital, what can you tell us, what insights do you have about the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on communities of color? Is that something that is reflected in your treatment of patients and your observations of trends within your practice? Yeah, so, um, you know, I work at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, which is located in Washington, D.C., um, and most of our population that we see coming in are African-American or um, Latinx. Um, and 
just even our um, employee population, so our associates who work at the hospital, um, there's a lot of people who are hesitant, both, both healthcare providers as well as patients and their families. Um, and so, you know, as a nurse practitioner, um, kind of see patients throughout the hospital in the emergency room as well as in clinic. And a, a lot of people kind of say the same things about being hesitant. So I tried to, I became a um, vaccinator of both associates and the community um, just to try to show that, you know, yes, you know, there are people who look like you who are giving out this vaccine, who are trying to encourage you to take the vaccine and giving as much education as possible. Um, but being on the front lines, you do see, I have seen a lot of people who look like me um, and taking care of patients who look just like me um, and look like the rest of us on this um, line today. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of fear um, because there are things that are circulated in the media that show that if I get the vaccine, I may get Bell's palsy. If I get the vaccine, I may die two hours later. Um, so I think media has definitely caused a lot of um, extra concern and extra caution amongst our community. Um, so I'm just glad today that we're trying to dispel some of those myths and um, ease some of those concerns that I definitely see every day from both patients, family, and staff. Dr. Garrett Ray, uh, and maybe Dr. Kaliana Rama, you may be able to chime in on, chime in on this as well. Um, you know, Shannon just mentioned a number of rumors that have gotten out. What have you heard? And we'll start with you, Dr. Garrett Ray. What have you heard that's running through the rumor mill that you've had to just, you know, it may seem silly to some people, but people that are literally circulating these things that they've been hearing, what are some of the things that you have heard that perhaps the record should be set straight on this call? So uh, I think I've heard uh, can I, that I'm going to get COVID from the vaccine, um, and you can't. Um, I've heard that it's going to alter my DNA. It doesn't. Um, I think that a uh, few other things that we also are hearing about the vaccine is that I don't need to get the vaccine because I've had COVID. That's, that's not true either. Uh, because of the fact that you, you're noticing that even if you have built some type of natural immunity from having COVID, it's not going to protect you like having the vaccination. And so, um, and then we were also looking at the antibodies. They, they're, the numbers are not the same, but we do know with the vaccine that it's 95% effective, 94% um, effective in, in the Moderna one. And then also, in the newer one with Johnson and Johnson, it's a little bit less effective. You know, I think it's around 85 right now, 66% reduction in terms of just um, severe uh, illnesses, et cetera. But those are a lot higher than if you actually had COVID and then tried to take your chances of protecting yourself through those that immunity. So those are, I think, some of the key things that I've heard um, in terms of the myths um, that are out there. Dr. Kaliana Rahman, one of the myths that I've heard um, and people have texted my show and asked me about this is there are concerns about the impact to maternal health and those that are aware of issues with you know, minorities and healthcare, maternal health is something that's a legitimate concern for many people. Are there any risks from a maternal perspective or from a reproductive perspective that come with these vaccines? Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, two parts to that. One is, uh, can pregnant women or breastfeeding women, can they get the vaccine? And they can. Um, that, you know, I like to, I like to always say you, you should consult with your doctor. But I think one thing to remember about this is that the risks from the virus itself are, are, are far greater than any risks from the vaccine. Um, and so we, particularly for women who are high risk when they're pregnant, it's going to be really important to have that conversation with your doctor to see if you uh, if you should get the vaccine. Um, and then the other question we get is around fertility. Will this affect fertility? And we get that both for men and women. Um, and really, no, it won't affect your fertility the way that uh, Dr. Garrett Ray explained it wonderfully. So that the mRNA vaccine isn't going to cause any problems with fertility down the line. There isn't any reason to think that. Okay. Um, so um, this is actually kind of a, I guess, a personal question from me, right? Um, and um, I did get permission from the, the panelists to do this. But I, one of the things that I remember as I was growing up, I grew up with 
parents who, uh, especially my mom and my grandma, who would always say, trust your body and trust your body's natural processes. And they would say, question the doctors. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone that had been raised. I do feel this is a bit of a cultural thing. I was talking with my cousins about it. And so as you get further and further, maybe Dr. Garrett Ray, you can kind of take this on. I'm also interested to hear from uh, Shannon on this as well. How do people reconcile this years and years of skepticism of medicine and skepticism of how people have been treated from their perspective, where they grew up in an environment where they were experimented on and things like that. And then there's people like me who I know where we are now. I understand the science, but there's still my grandma's head, you know, my grandma's voice in my head or my mom's voice in my head saying, you know, don't just take for granted everything they're trying to put at you. What do you recommend for people like myself who are trying to reconcile those gaps? What's different today, I guess, maybe I would ask that, I don't know. Um, so there are a few things, but I think the key thing is choice, right? And also having the science behind to make the appropriate choices that are for us. Um, with Tuskegee, I think people bring that up all the time. We didn't have choice, okay? And, and we didn't understand and people didn't say to us, listen, <laughs> Um, these are some of the options. These are these are the things to think about in terms of consent. There was a, there were not in, individuals involved that were monitoring the process in terms of these trials to make sure that they are ethically appropriate for all. That's a big big difference from now. So when uh, you look at these trials and you look at the research team behind it and you look at the individuals in FDA or even CDC, they have ensured that we have a seat at that table. There is diversity um, with from the scientist to making sure that the trials are appropriate um, and, and actually including all of us. And that's important. That is really important because before we weren't there and people, you know, and I mean, trust me, my grandma, my grandma was in the nursing field and and there, she was skeptical about some things too, because of the fact that she remembers those times. But I know now it, it, the things that I have been learn, learning and over time is that you have to follow the science and you have to make sure that you talk to the right people to ask those questions and to answer them for yourselves. If I didn't feel safe with this, this vaccine, I would not have gotten it myself, right? If I had not gotten this, I would not, if I didn't believe it, and I wouldn't have given that to my family. Both of my parents have been vaccinated. They're older. And, um, and I, would not, I would not be here today. So I wanna make sure people understand that, that we're not just here because, just because, it's because we care about everyone on this call and wanna make sure that you hear about the science. The science should be following us, not the myth. It, right. The science should be following us, not the fear. We want to protect because Tuskegee didn't worry about that with us. I hate to say this. They, was not worry, they were not worried about whether or not we were going to live or survive over this. Now we have people that said, here's a vaccine. We have people that said, here's an er um, emergency um, agreement, okay, acceptance of this right now because we all want to get through this. They paused the trials to make sure that we had appropriate numbers a black and brown Latina community actually in there so that we could actually see how we were going to respond to this. We cannot give this option or this opportunity up because of the fact that I think we have some fear. This is a time and I appreciate um, the Annapolis alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta having this because it's showing care in the community for us to continue to move on. Uh, Shannon, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I definitely agree with Dr. Garrett Ray, um, but also you have the power to educate yourself. You have the power to look at the trials. You have the power to go on CDC website, to Google clinicaltrials.gov, to be able to see the information for yourself. Um, and I think, you know, being more educated about what's going on, how the vaccine is working, hearing testimonials from people who have taken those vaccines can help, you know, dispel those myths. And also, again, having a trusted healthcare provider, someone that you trust 
who has your best interest in mind, who has your family's best interest in mind, just discussing your concerns. Um, you know, there are people who have concerns about other comorbidities that they may have and how that may affect them if they take the vaccine. That's something to talk to your healthcare provider about if that's concerning for you. So definitely education, talking to trusted healthcare professionals um, are definitely things that you have in your corner to make sure that you have the, you know, all the information you need to take the vaccine. It's a fantastic point, and um, I, I really appreciate that. And I will just say, um, moving into the next phase, right, we do with the few minutes that we have left, I do want to talk a little bit about getting the vaccines. Um, speaking personally, uh, my mom got her first vaccine. I always trusted the science. I've always been more of a rational person anyway, but I do admit there was that little bit of hesitancy that when I found out my mom got the vaccine, like there was something that was this block in my head that was like, oh, well, this must be totally okay, right? Because she's more skeptical than I am. So let's talk about these community vaccination centers because I think that those, those engagement, those interactions are what's at the heart of the Anne Arundel County Department of Health and other departments of health as they're trying to push this equity-driven um, approach. Dr. Kaliana Rahman, what can you tell us about these community vaccine clinics? So these are, these are gonna be clinics that are in partnership with community organizations. We're starting with faith organizations and initially it's gonna be with black churches. Um, and the idea is very much to have the community organizations leading the process. So um, obviously doing the vaccinations in the community, uh, starting with the churches, um, but also having volunteers from that community. And I think most importantly, having those organizations identify people in the community to get vaccinated. And I think that the system that we have, the, you know, the multiple websites, the, 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 the registering here and there, what that's selecting for is people who know how to register on websites, right? Um, it doesn't say anything about whether you should be the next one to get it or not. Um, and that's what we've been trying to get at from this equity standpoint is there's people who have higher risk and, and, and we all know that Blacks have a higher risk of getting this and dying from it, getting hospitalized from it. Um, and that's why we're prioritizing the Black community for this. So we're, our goal is to start with one, one organization next week and then we'll be building after that. Um, each week we are looking to get more and more on board. Um, and really our big, uh, our big ho thing holding us back is vaccine supply. The more supply we get, the more we'll be doing this. And where can people go to find out where there is a community vaccine center? In their, in so their... That's actually being led by the community organization. So it's okay. Not, so one of the things that we have learned from other jurisdictions that to do this, when you advertise it widely, it doesn't stay as a community vaccination site. It becomes a place that a whole lot of people who don't live in that community or engage in those communities, start coming to. I think the best example um, that, I, that I heard is Bread for the City in DC. It's a homeless services organization. Um, they put a clinic up there and they saw a lot of affluent white people who would never be in that building otherwise. Yeah. That's not what they're going for. There are systems for that. Um, it's gonna be up to the community organizations to identify people. Grassroots at its finest. Um, Dr. Garrett Ray, uh, before we move to our next phase, uh, a lot of people are asking the question, if you get vaccinated, do you still have to wear a mask? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an easy one. Um, even though we are vaccinated, that helps to build our immunity, you can still carry the, vac the virus in your nasal passages. And so so we're wearing the mask also to protect those that have not been vaccinated that do not have the immunity as well. Um, and so just want to make sure everybody remembers those three W's, wear your mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands. We still have to do that. And the vaccine is just helping us to get one step further so we can get back to some type of normal state. But yes, wear your mask. And our last question for our panel will go to Shannon Burton. And this is actually a very, very good question. Um, if, you, if you are unsure that you might have COVID or you get COVID, and you live in small quarters or have a number of people that are in your household, how do you effectively quarantine? 
Yeah, um, so that's a good question. So we would recommend if you are in a home with multiple people that you, it's like if say it's a, a husband and a, a wife or you know two partners to sleep separately, uh, not to share the same space. So with that person who is separated um, and isolated, I would recommend using disposable cutlery, plates and cups, um, giving that person their own trash can so they can dispose of their own trash um, separate from the um, other people in the home. Um, if that person goes to the bathroom, then if they're well enough, they should clean the bathroom themselves um, and then give that bathroom some time to air out before the next person goes in. But say that person is too ill to be able to clean up after themselves. So we would recommend that you kind of let the bathroom air out and then the person who is going in to use the bathroom, that they have a mask and that they disinfect the bathroom before they use it. Um, as well, you just want to make sure that, you know, while you're in the house, that you guys are socially distanced, that you're trying to be six feet apart if you can. Again, wiping down those high touch surfaces, um, making sure that you're disinfecting, not sharing phones and forks and spoons and cups with the person who is sick. So truly trying to separate that person from you um, as much as you can. Um, and some people who may live in a studio apartment, we know that you can't, there's no other room to go to sleep in, but if you can try to stay as distant as possible, both of you all have masks on um, to protect yourselves. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for your time this evening. This is the part where if we were at a building, you would all be getting an applause, but I will encourage all of our attendees to take a moment to uh, pass your gratitude along and thanks are in the chat to our panelists. Dr. Niles Kaliana Rahman from the Anne Arundel County Department of Health, Dr. Stacy Garrett Ray from the University of Maryland Medical System, and Shannon P. Burton, uh, nurse practitioner at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, your service is greatly appreciated. And uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and keeping our communities safe. As part of our planned programming, we are going to transition to testimonials where we're going to hear from members in the community uh, about their own experiences with COVID and getting vaccinated. Our first testimonial is going to come from Latifa Hughes. This is a wife and mother of three who has cared for two children with COVID. Latifa, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to my sorors of the Annapolis alumni, alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta for inviting me here to talk about my experiences as a caregiver for COVID. I also give thanks to, to God for being able to have me here to have this testimony because I have had two daughters who experienced COVID at the same time and they are now survivors. But I'm also sending some sincere condolences out to families of um, <clears throat> friends or anyone on this panel who may know someone who is among the 500,000 dear souls who did not survive this novel COVID, COVID disease. Um, I not only am I a caregiver of survivors, but I actually have close have lost close family members who are among the 500,000, quite a few family members and friends. So I imagine we may have some on this on this call as well who have experienced the same and have also been a caregiver. So towards the end of 2020, um, just about before Thanksgiving holiday, I was steadily planning a way for my family to enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday in a changed world that we know it with the pandemic. We were very good about, um, for the greater part of the year, staying indoors, going basically out if we needed to go to work or to the grocery store, but mostly being very cognizant of social distancing, washing our hands, wearing our masks, um, and ensuring that we were um, <clears throat> social distancing. Um, so, and added to which my two daughters who actually had come down with COVID, they had, they were in high, high impact jobs where they were tested on a weekly basis for the COVID test because of the types of jobs that they held. And they consisted entire year. However, it took one weekend 
with a small group of friends to turn that all around and to really turn our worlds upside down. Um, my daughters actually had um, had a weekend with some very close friends, a very small group. And to the group's knowledge, no one um, in the group had a positive test and they had um, negative tests for COVID. Um, by the early part of the week following that weekend that they um, had the youngest, my, my two daughters start, started to experience um, symptoms. So the first one, she um, she had more very low symptoms, like it just immediate body aches. The the other one had more uh, pretty moderate symptoms, like by that fourth day, and um, they both took the test and they tested positive. So we but receiving this news, um, I think the way to explain it is that I could have been, if anyone is familiar with this time period, put in the middle of a Spike Lee movie where all of the walls and the backgrounds move around you, but you're standing still because you're wondering what's going on in your life. I was frozen because I didn't know what to do. I had strong feelings of fear, wondering who else in my family, in my household may have um, this, con may, may have gotten um, infected because they were infected. Um, I also have my husband and my son that I live with. Um, fortunately, we all, the three of us, um, tested negative. So I was, um, and also I had, I had immense anxiety um, about what I needed to do to quarantine, to make sure we were going to be really rigorous with washing our hands and social distancing and wearing masks inside of the comfort of our own home. The mass paranoia really took me over because the anxiety with overkill with the um, disinfectants and ensuring that I was um, keeping all areas clean and keeping everyone isolated. I also felt a slight bit of betrayal because with my daughters constantly testing negative and then they were out with friends and everyone to their knowledge said that they were negative. Um, I just kind of, you know, I just kind of felt like, okay, someone came to wherever they were. They probably shouldn't even have been together in the first place. I know they shouldn't have, but, um, but I couldn't dwell on that too much because these people who also were, had come down with the, with the disease, they also had infected family members as well. So all I could do at that time is really make sure I prayed for them anyway, and just put the feelings of betrayal aside. The depression really set in. Um, due to me not feeling that I would be helpful enough for my two daughters and being able to help them ensure that they can come overcome this disease because of so much of the unknowns. I feel like I was going into constant circles. But I did actually manage for you know, to get myself together and kick into action with really in kicking into action as a caregiver. It was kick into action for the ones you're caring for, not really for yourself. So really, I took myself out of it. I didn't even think of myself, which was a bit, not a good thing to do at all if you're going to be a caregiver. But what was crystal clear to me was that isolation um, had to take place. Um, I had them on round the clock watch. We, um, we, I dug really, really deep into my own background in public health training, and I decided to pull together um, just information that I have read about through CDC site and some of what some of the local hospitals have said about how to really work on and stay ahead of the symptoms as best as you can. Because in my mind, going to the hospital um, was not going to be an option. I was going to do all that I could to make sure that um, <laughs> there was not going to be an option for me to do that. Um, I stayed, I made sure I stayed in very close contact with um, the urgent care providers and the primary care physicians of my daughters um, who were treating them just to make sure that I was um, getting what I need as the input to stay rigorously ahead of their symptoms. Um, they gave me lots of input and recommendations, many of what I've heard on this call today. Um, they did uh, in some ways talk about some supplements and things of that nature, but it was mostly about the over-the-counter things that I needed to do to stay ahead of the symptoms. So this was really two weeks of my life that was committed to managing care um, to make sure that they were not going to be totally suffering. But my one of my daughters got progressively worse. Um, in, the, in that first week. And at the same time, I was losing material sleep and lack of food. Um, I was pretty malnourished at the time because I was solely focused on my babies. They made me grown, but they're still my babies. 
Um, I was up all, on every hour on the hour, timing their symptoms, tracking the progression of their symptoms, running to stores to get whatever the doctor may have told me at the time, if they got a certain symptom to, um, to get ahead of it. I, um, I, I, you know, my oldest daughter got progressively worse um, over the two week period. Her symptoms did not really start to subside until around the ninth or 10th day. My younger daughter didn't show too much um, symptoms, but I knew that she was still in the infection period and she still needed to um, be watched and treated as we um, went along. So I, my life was in a real um, merry-go-round. Um, I believe my older daughter may have gotten almost all of the symptoms that you could get um, that were listed um, by CDC on the things to, to, to look out for um, during this entire ordeal. I did have great support from my family, even when at times, I really felt like as a caregiver, I ended up isolating them out. They found a way in, whether it was really reaching out to talk to my daughters on my own behalf, and I was living in the house with them to, in order to kind of track to their symptoms. Any family or friends that I had that actually had clinical backgrounds actually called to check on them <laughs> on their own unofficial status to, um, to understand what was going on. Um, so I journaled every moment of what, what went on with with me. Um, I know everybody has a different circumstance. However, when I hear or understand that a person that I know has ex is experiencing going through this as a caregiver of someone, I give them a few pointers um, based on what my experience was, and hopefully they will serve as prevention to these um, as they if they have to go through this ordeal. So the first is, first and foremost, please Sora consider- Hughes. Sora Hughes. Thank you so much, but we have a few more testimonials. We don't want to we don't want to break in there, but we have a few more, and we've only allotted about five minutes per testimonial. Um, but you have given us a wealth of information, so we want to be able to get to the other testimonials. And if Mr. Snow has enough time, we'll get back to those so you can share that. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right, and. Uh, with that in mind, our next testimonial is going to come from uh, Courtney Salisbury, a nursing student, patient care technician at Mercy Hospital, who's actually received the vaccine. Um, hi, everyone. So just like a lot of people at first, I was very hesitant about getting the vaccine. You know, I knew I was in nursing school and I knew that would be an option for me. And at first I was thinking, you know, I'm going to wait. I'll go on the second round. I'll see how everybody else does. And then I'll get the vaccine. Um, but then I had to just, you know, sit down and really think about it. And was like, you know, what is my reason of not wanting to get the vaccine? And it was the media. And, you know, you hear things about like, I'm going to get COVID by the vaccine or I'm going to have all these side effects. So like the doctors and um, Shannon Burton said, I researched on my own. I looked up the trials, I looked up what's in the vaccine, um, the side effects, what could have been short term, long term, you know, how they developed the vaccine. And then once I received that information, I knew for myself as well as my family, it was the best decision to receive it. And then I wanted to also be able to set the example for my family. Um, my grandparents have gotten it. And um, it was because, you know, I've gotten the vaccine and they heard about, you know, how it's not what they think. And I was able to educate them on that. So um, I was really appreciative that I was able to receive the vaccine. And I hope if everyone gets the opportunity or when they get the opportunity, um, you all will just research on your own, um, make the best decision for you and your family and don't do it because everyone else is telling you to, but don't do it because you're not informed. Thank you so much, Ms. Salisbury, for your testimony there. Our next testimony is going to come from uh, Bishop, I believe, Bishop Craig Coates. Um, is a senior pastor at Fresh Start Church in Glen Burnie. He's also an entrepreneur, educator, businessman, and author who has received the vaccine. And um, maybe we'll translate it into One Church of God in Christ Minute. So it's about, what, 15 minutes or so? I'm teasing well, you. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm one of those folks that don't like to take even two minutes, get to the point and keep it moving. So I'm gonna donate two minutes. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely did get the vaccine. Um, and actually I journal, journaled my entire process live video from the time that I was leaving to go get it to each day afterwards for both shots. 
um, mainly for this reason. I'm a pastor in the Af primarily African-American church, which means my role is one that everyone looks up to for anything, any advice. We are lawyer, doctor, we're all of those things. And I had been following this since 2019 when it was overseas in October. And I was very much aware of what was going on. I always followed the science and um, I was pleased with the results. But personally, I was very afraid about side effects. But I decided to coin the expression to do it afraid, you know, do it even though I'm afraid, because what I decided to do was make a conscious decision that's informed, an informed decision that this is why I'm getting this vaccine because of the number of people I impact every day, both physically in my home, as well as as a pastor. And I know that the African-American community is suffering at, in disparate numbers. And the only way we can really lead the African-American community to this is that the leaders of that community have to be first examples. But I wanna say this though, one of the biggest challenges that I knew we were facing is I was only able to get the vaccine because I'm also with the police department. I don't believe we'd be having the same conversation yet because of the scarcity you know, lack of um, available supply. But I'm so happy to announce that we have partnered with that organization that Dr. Nalesh talked about partnering with uh, a whole collaboration of churches um, that serve the primarily African-American community, the entire county. Um, and we have currently in, uh, in less than a week and three days, we have had empowerment sessions and we've had almost 700 people are signed up to get the vaccine. So I, I think the ties are changing in terms of people are making a decision. It's just, we need more vaccines. So that my experience was I got both shots and I had very little side effects, but I also understood and shared with those watching that side effects are a good thing. That means your body's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So thank you for allowing me to share. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was an encouragement uh, to me as well. Um, our final testimonial, will come from Ms. Fikirta Forrester. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner at Concerted Care Group, primary caregiver for her mother and assisted in the care of her grandfather. Uh, and she's gonna talk a bit about her experiences there. Good evening, Silverwoods and guests. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I would first like to thank the Physical and Mental Health Committee for allowing like me and my family to be a part of their program. I also would like to put a special thank you out to Cheryl Lightsey, my line sister, who personally asked me to be a part of this program. So thank you again, Cheryl. Um, COVID has been a bearing on everyone's life. When I first heard about COVID, I, uh, I would never imagine that it would um, infect my family. And that meant like my whole immediately family, my whole immediate family. Um, the virus, the first, the next thing, the first, I'm sorry, the first thing that happened was my cousin was um, tested positive for COVID. Then and suddenly in May 7th, my mother contacted um, COVID. She got a call that her test came back positive for COVID. And she would like to discuss what COVID, her experience with COVID. Hi. Um, my name is Cassandra Gross. I'm for Curtis' mother, and um, I just want to share a little experience that I, I dealt with COVID. I, I work in a um, health center, um, and I've, um, I've been there for like 16 years, and um, COVID-19 entered into the building. It was about a 10 10 patients that they had on isolation there. And we had to protect ourselves with masks and gargles and the whole night, you know, keeping our hands clean or whatever. And, you know, I never had no idea. I thought I was doing everything that I was supposed to do to protect myself from COVID. <laughs> anyway, I ended up with COVID. Um, I hadn't got diagnosed. I hadn't got actually tested positive before I got this cough. I started coughing and I know every time I coughed, there would people would just, I mean, my coworkers would say, they would jump away from me and move away from me. And I knew, I told my daughter, I said, I got this cough. I said, this, is, this cough is a strange cough. I said, it's not a regular cough. And she said, oh, mommy, you probably got allergies. I said, no, this cough is different. Anyway, to make, 
I ended up going, I said, I'm going to get tested tomorrow. I got tested. I was positive. And I'm not going to, I'm going to sit here and be honest. I was positive. And when I was told that I was positive, I was immediately scared. I went to, they told me to go in the back for 14 days and be on isolation. <laughs> Those 14 days took so long and it was so lonely. I was sick. I had all, I had the symptoms of the cough. I had, I never got a temperature, but the cough, the diarrhea, the no taste, and just more than anything, just the loneliness, the loneliness. I, I, I did more praying than I did anything else. I, um, um, I was taken care of with, you know, my husband bought me tea, bought me food on a daily basis all through the day. And, but I just wanted to just stay, I just felt like I needed to stay in that fetal position and just pray, pray, pray. Anyway, I, one day he forgot to bring me my dinner. My granddaughter brought me lunch over and I, I called her and she brought me lunch over. And when she came to bring me lunch, she brought me lunch and and my, I called for Kurt. I said, I don't have anything to eat, but Theory is bringing me lunch. And she said, well, you can go down the hall and go to the back door and let her in to give you the lunch. So I went down the hall to let her in to give me the lunch. And my granddaughter bought me lunch. And when she brought me the lunch, I opened the door, the back porch door, and she had the lunch hanging on a stick. And she pointed the stick in, and I had to get the bag off the stick. I felt like crying. It just was a lonely, lonely, dark experience for me. Um, and, it, you know, even after the 14 days of being sick, finally they said, oh, you can come out now. So I came out and I went and got tested and they said, you're still positive. Go back for seven more days. I went back for seven more days back in the same dark, lonely room. I had, I, had, I had a lot of friends and people that cared about me. They put food and stuff in the door for me, all kinds of teas, thermometers, they did everything. But it still didn't, just didn't take away. I think it just was the mere fact of being in, in, in loneliness and darkness. And, you know, no, no pain, but just, loneliness I, I i couldn't understand you know why how i felt the way that i felt anyway after that i went back again and i was still tested positive i was positive for 28 days and finally i went to my doctor i said i'm not going to these people no more i didn't even want to believe i said i can't believe that i'm still you know dealing with this disease like this so i went to my doctor and she said, finally, she said, you have the antibiotics. You can come out now and your antibiotics will help you fight this disease. So I came out and then my job said, well, you got to get tested two times before you can come back to work. So I got tested one time and I went back and I was positive again. So I decided I just... I stayed off my job for four months before I even went back because I just, I became very, very depressed about it. I just, you know, I just didn't know. I just felt like I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether I was going to get out of this thing or what. But anyway, I, you know, through the grace of God, here I am sitting here today, clean, from COVID-19, I, I, I'm thinking that I still have antibodies in me. I'm still at the uh, same assistant living that I was working in first. And I'm just grateful to be here to be able to tell my story. And I know, and then after, I guess maybe after four, after my four months of being clean from it, here comes my dad, 91 years old with COVID-19, and he was really sick. And we were really afraid that he wasn't going to, you know, we just didn't know what was going to happen for him because he was hospitalized twice. And the second time that he came out of the hospital, even though I had been through the experience of everything, I had to just put on the, 
breast of uh, righteousness and let my father into my house so I could take care of him and help him to survive. So he came into my house and he stayed in my house with me for three months while I took care of him with COVID-19. And it was not, it was just, it just wasn't an easy thing. I mean, I, I, wow. I have experienced myself. I experienced seeing my father go through it. And, you know, I just the thought of knowing that we, it might've been a chance that we, we wouldn't survive especially him at 91 years old, wow. but he did. Thank you, Thank you so much for sharing that. That was, um, you know, I, I hope that everybody listening uh, and watching this entire presentation gained a sense of the gravity of what it is that we're doing. And, you know, I, I think of the people that gave testimonials. I think of the panelists that answered questions a lot of time and energy has gone into many of these efforts to reach out to our communities to really, especially get our communities to take this seriously the way that we should. So with that being said, and with everything that you've heard tonight, and I see that the vast majority of you uh, were able to hear the uh, entirety of the presentation, I'm going to relaunch this poll. And um, first of all, I'm going to put the results out so that everybody can see the results. I'm gonna relaunch the poll and ask everyone to fill it out again to see if anyone has had a change of heart, if this was persuasive at all. So currently 81% uh, of the attendees said that they would be willing to take the vaccine if given the opportunity. 19% said they were not willing. We're gonna relaunch the poll and um, give you an opportunity to fill that out. Um, while that's coming in, um, I do want to thank everyone uh, for taking so much time uh, to, you know, get prepared on this subject, to prepare content, to research. And also, I do want to charge everyone that's watching uh, that's participating in this call, I want to challenge everyone to not just take this message and internalize it, but to share it. Uh, I can tell you uh, with certainty that my experience that uh, with COVID-19 and the vaccine, when I found out that my pastor was getting it, when I found out that my mom had gotten it, my dad plans to get it, it made a difference. It was talking on the phone that even though I was a little bit hesitant, when I found out that they were getting the vaccine, I felt like, okay, any sort of hesitancy that I had was gone. Every one of you has an opportunity to take uh, that message out uh, to those around you. So I want to encourage you guys to do the same. Uh, I, oh, I'm not sure what happened with the poll, um, but I had relaunched it. Maybe there was some confusion with that. But I believe that people were largely convinced. <laughs> um, um, I believe I only saw uh, maybe a few individuals. Oh, it looks like it's up again. So go ahead and cast your votes. Um, that'll, that'll be valuable insights to our host. Uh, I do want to turn it back over uh, to Ms. Tawana Holland uh, to offer any closing remarks that she may have on this. Thank you so much, Tori Snow. You did a wonderful job. Thank you to all of our panelists and our testimonials. It was a very, very rich conversation and wonderful, important information. Now I'll turn it over to our chapter president, Naz Afi of the Annapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Thank you, Ms. Holland. I have been enlightened so much this evening uh, and I hope everyone else has as well. Um, amazingly, we have been living in this very, very difficult time of this pandemic for almost one year. And it has been a time of great uncertainty and confusion as we've heard this evening, most of the time. And the coming of the vaccine heightened everyone's anxiety, especially in our 
African American community. We have been crippled by the pandemic in many families. There has been much loss. The loss is cut deep in many families. So on behalf of the Annapolis Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Beta Sorority Incorporated, I want to say how much we appreciate the medical and health experts that have come to us this evening to bring information. Dr. Dr. Garrett Ray, Dr. Kaliana, and Nurse Burton, your efforts in bringing us um, vital information is much appreciated. I also want to thank our partners in bringing this event to you this evening, the United Black Cler Clergy of, Af of, the African of the Anne Arundel County, the uplift program from mayor from the mayor of Annapolis off, office for African American outreach, the Baltimore Washington Medical Center, the Divine Nine, the Fresh Start Church, and the Asbury Broadneck Baptist Church. And we also want to thank all the participants that took the time to be with us this evening so that we could collectively see what we need to do in our community. And thank you so much for those that shared their stories. Their stories about the inequity in contracting the, the, this illness and disease and the treatment. And so we learned a lot about the history of the development of the vaccine. We learned a lot about the differences in, in the various uh, options. And so again, we thank you. We thank all of you. And our last words are keep washing your hands, keep keeping the social distancing, keep wearing the mask and stay safe. So thank you to all of you and an absolute round of applause for our moderator. Thank you, Mr. Tori Snow. Everyone be safe.